Well, I hope everybody had a good holiday, whatever good is, and it's nice to see you here today. Uh, some of us didn't leave L.A. This is the best time to be here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, next month, um, I'm going to be interviewed by somebody from UCLA. I, I received uh, a letter in June uh, asking if I would be interested in being interviewed, and it's for the UCLA Oral History Library. And uh, he's wrapped up a lot of stuff, and so he wants to start next month with me from four to six interviews, a couple hours apiece, about my life and Buddhism in Los Angeles, which is daunting and and conflicting as well, because when you start down, start to think about your life and want to verbalize it and put it into sort of a linear format and define the choices you made and why, it's, you wake up at 3 in the morning going, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, I want to say that. And, of course, at 7, you've c- completely forgotten what you wanted to say. And then I thought about, well, you know, it's sort of like Buddhism in a way. It's about the path. And, and you have the path of your life. And you have a lot of luck and a lot of choices and a lot of circumstances you found yourself in. And then we have the path of Buddhism, the Eightfold Path. And we've probably all heard the Eightfold Path a hundred times before. But every time I think about the Eightfold Path, it's the first time. It's like cornflakes, taste it again for the first time. <laughs> and new stories come and new reflections come about that. So leading up to my finding the Eightfold Path, uh, it was 1977, which ironically is when the first Star Wars movie came out. And I was working in retail and I was managing and I was in charge and I felt satisfied that my career was going in a good direction. And then I went into a mild depression for two years. And and I'm not quite sure what the trigger was. We all get depressed. It wasn't like suicide depression. It was just sort of gloomy. You'd wake up in the morning and the sun didn't completely shine on you. And I looked around at the world and I was a little disappointed because I had been told that the world was really a good place and all you had to do was work really hard and you would be satisfied and happy and fulfilled. And I had been working five and six days a week and had worked my way up from assistant sales person part-time to full-time to system manager to manager and uh, over a period of years, and it felt like I was going someplace. And I think in 1977, I started to realize there was no place to go. And I looked at the world, and I realized that no matter how hard you work, some people were going to make it really big, and some people weren't going to make it at all. And some people had, like, a lot of stuff, and some people didn't have much stuff at all. And all the things that made other people happy may not have triggered the happiness in you. And was there a refuge? Where could you go? What did you need to do? And so I went to the gym. And I had never been to the gym before, so it was a new experience. But I looked at a lot of healthy people that I wanted to be like. And physically, it was challenging because I was pushing 30. And and so my ideal was Arnold Schwarzenegger. I figured if I could look half as good as he did, I would be on the road to success. And and of course, um, none of us have the same genetics. None of us have uh, the opportunity to work out as much as we perhaps like to or want to. But I started to investigate what it meant to have a body. And I thought, wow, you know, you, you do this and you do that and your body feels good and your body feels tired and your body gets bigger and so I went from being rather thin to being rather, uh, I don't, not overweight, but I, I had protein shakes that had like 5,000 calories, and I would drink those, and I'm going, thinking they would all, of course, turn into muscle, you know. <laughs> and, and, 
And, and then I had been smoking for 14 years and I quit smoking. And, and then I started to realize there was something else involved in being happy and that was my mind. So I was doing a lot of stuff for my body to get it into shape and make it more durable and, and maybe not have it last longer but have it last with more quality while it was still here. But coming to the mind was a, a big jump because I had never really thought about me having anything upstairs to work with. I thought it just happened all by itself. And of course it did for 27 years. And then I thought maybe I can get involved with what I think and see and hear and maybe I can add another perspective to my life by being part of the process. So I bought some books on meditation, not necessarily Buddhist meditation, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. You just got to concentrate. You can visualize. There's guided meditation. I really got into hypnotism for a while. I thought, that is so cool. Hypnotism, you know, and, and somebody can talk you into, you know, being like a wooden plank and stand on you, and how great is that? And, and then I started to see, you know, all this, this guided meditation and all this hypnotism and all this other stuff is like they were in charge of you. It wasn't about you at all. It was about what they wanted you to do, which has had been what everybody wanted me to do my whole life. But now for the first time, I wanted to do it. I wanted to be in charge. So I, I gave up studying hypnotism. I gave up guided meditation and I just said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to sit. And when I decided just to sit, I found Buddhism. And I found Buddhist meditation. And the idea of sitting and looking, sitting and observing, watching yourself arise, exist, and pass away. But first of all, when you first start, you've got to have a perspective. You have to be able to look at yourself and witness yourself. And I didn't know how to create the witness because I was always... The parade, I was never watching the parade. So I had to sort of like go, okay, what does my parade look like? And I needed to find a place to sit to watch my parade. And actually, my parade was pretty good. I, I enjoyed all the things I thought about and all the connections I made from one thought to the next and the stories I was able to tell. And, and then I realized, you know, that stuff was just the superficial me. That stuff was just the stuff that other people saw and was able to interact with. But, but what was the true nature of me? And, and so I kept sitting and sitting. And then if, if you're into Zen at all, you realize your true nature is emptiness, which doesn't give you a whole lot to work with, you know. <laughs> and then I'm, so I'm sort of sitting there going, okay, yeah, now I'm getting here. And then I found the Dharma. You know, and I found the teachings of the Buddha, and the first book was the, the Dhammapada. And I'm going, wow, this is so cool. That makes so much sense right away, right away. And then through the Dhammapada, I came into contact with the Eightfold Path. And I thought, okay, this is it. Once I'm on the path, I will go to the goal. And I just have to stay on the path, and the goal will be there, and I will achieve the goal. And, and it was just years later that I realized uh, the path could be the goal. That maybe there isn't any goal at all. Maybe you're just on the path. And the reason there's no goal is because you're already there. So I'm going to obtain the unobtainable because I've already obtained it. I'm just going to realize it in some practical way or some esoteric way. So I came to the first one, and the first one was right view. And I thought, well, that's an interesting place to start because it's rather profound. It's a rather profound starting place. And then my understanding of the right view was the right view of the Four Noble Truths. So I read the Four Noble Truths and I go, okay, I understand the Four Noble Truths. I've got right view down. But then another aspect of right view I found out later was karma. Right view of karma. What is the cause and consequence of your life? How do you participate? How do you become a contributing factor in that? And so I stayed with the first path factor for a while and worked out in my own head what the Four Noble Truths were, memorized their order, and started to understand just a bit about karma. 
but karma is very profound and very complex, and it takes a lifetime to understand that you don't understand it. So I went from right view to right intention. Now, as I had been sitting in just silence, um, I, all these thoughts would come up, and, and I couldn't find any intention in there. All I saw were thoughts connected to other thoughts, and then sometimes clusters of thoughts. So what is an intention, I said to myself, and I went to the dictionary and looked up intention. And then what is a Buddhist intention? And is there, what's the difference between a good intention and a bad intention? And it turns out to be the outcome. If you have a good intention, then there tends to be less suffering. If you have a bad intention, there tends to be more suffering. But good and bad aren't really useful words in Buddhism, so it turns out to be skillful and unskillful. So if I can create a skillful intention, I will have a better outcome. I will suffer less, and people around me will suffer less. And then I came to the three poisons. Okay, so those seem to be connected to right intention. Three poisons are greed, hatred, and delusion. And the antidote is generosity, compassion, and wisdom. I'm going, okay, what I need to do is I need to be aware of my intentions before I speak or act, which means I need to be able to reflect on my thought patterns as they manifest before they turn into speech and action. So I'm there and I'm watching my thoughts and I'm starting to say less and less, which is not good if you're in retail because you're supposed to say a lot of stuff and when there's no desire at all, you're supposed to create it and then satisfy it. It's a great cycle of, you know, suffering. So, I, so there I was, and I'm looking at all this stuff, right view, right intention, and then I get into right speech. And I'm thinking to myself, do I have right speech? You know, what do I say to people? Whether it's a professional speech or just an interpersonal speech with friends and relatives. Am I really skillful in what I say? Are people happy or after I speak than before I speak? And, you know, a lot of times they weren't. And I started to reflect on, on speech and how important it is maybe sometimes not to say anything at all. And so at 27 to 28, you know, I'm starting to think I'm in the wrong profession. I'm just, I'm talking about nonsense, I'm creating desire, I'm satisfying desire, I'm hiring and firing people, I'm causing them so much suffering, causing myself suffering because they're suffering, and then I say to myself, well, what am I going to do? And I took a couple months off. I had some money in the bank, I had an old car, and, and the road was empty, and I just got on the road, and I just watched other people and what they did. And I noticed there's certain parts of the country where people who look just like me did really different things and thought about things in different ways. Not better, not worse, but just different. And I, I saw that cities and states have a profound influence on the way we look at the world. And in some cases, I was happy that I could say my home is in Los Angeles. But when I saw the response that people gave me in Ohio about living in Los Angeles, I wasn't so sure. You know? Because they thought Ohio was pretty good. So I, I got an idea that yeah, maybe we don't need to define ourselves by what we do. Maybe our, our job doesn't have to be who we are. Maybe there's a way to be something else and still work. And I continued to meditate and continue to study and then write speech, write action. Okay, not to steal, not to kill, not to indulge in sexual misconduct. Wow, okay, now I'm reflecting on all those things and seeing how those apply to my life and then judging myself, critiquing myself on how well I've done in all those categories or didn't do. And, and I just saw clearly the superficiality of my life. And this is such a great time of year to reflect on how bad stuff is. <laughs> you know, we have more Christmas blues come out this time of year and they're the best songs ever, you know. I've been down so long, the carpet done faded on the floor, you know. I'm like, yeah, my kind of song. So I, I started to, to see that, you know, life could be dim if you didn't do anything about it. 
But how do you turn on the light? How do you turn on the energy? What do you need to do? And so I started with the body, and now I'm getting into the mind, and I'm getting into how I've been manipulated by city, state, and family, and how I've been created to serve a function, to consume and produce. And I thought, does anybody ever get free? Do they ever just, like, no, I'm not going to do it. And then, and then I remember somebody I used to work with who wanted to be a philosopher. And I'm thinking, how is a philosopher going to make any money? What are they going to do? So I struggled with, what can I do? What can I do to have a more authentic lifestyle? And then, right livelihood. Wow, that was a really important part of the Eightfold Path, right livelihood. That I could choose to do something that was a benefit to all. And ultimately, it would be a benefit to me. So I could be a garbage man, or work for the city, or do all sorts of stuff to make life better and easier for people around me. But I still had to pay rent, so I continued to do my retail stuff and wish I didn't. And then, and then, a couple years later, 1993, I decided to move in to the International Buddhist Meditation Center. You know, and there were some really odd people living there. (laughs) And I wasn't used to that. I had come from Palms, you know right by Culver City, and now I'm going to like Koreatown and people that live in a meditation center, and why are all these people here, and how did they all get here, and they all got there for different reasons. And, and I started the process of, of becoming a monk, and most of the people who were at the International Buddhist Meditation Center who have been ordained didn't want to be a monk, they wanted to be a Dharma teacher. Because that gave them more flexibility in life. They could have boyfriends and girlfriends. They could have a job. They could still have like a regular American lifestyle. But on the weekends, they could be a monk. And they could put their robes on and they gave profound talks. And and then they go back to doing whatever they did. But I wanted to, to have a lifestyle. I wanted more than just to be a weekend monk. I wanted a lifestyle. And, and like a lot of people when they come to that place in their life, don't know how to do it. And I didn't either. I got lucky. But the first thing you need to do is you need to find a teacher and a place that's teaching. Okay. So I found that. And then then luckily enough, we had a residential program. So I had a place to live. And I had to pay rent, but it wasn't much rent compared to what I was paying. And, And I had the opportunity to meditate and hang out with people who were rather odd, but on a spiritual path, just like I was. And we could compare notes, and we could share ideas, and we could share stories, and, and it all sort of worked out fine. And then 1994, I became a novice monk. And the abbess of the center, Karuna Dharma, said, we'd like you to work for us. And I thought, wow, I'll never have to you know, do that other work again. And so I said, okay. So I started off as residential manager, I watered the lawns, I fed the animals, I did all that kind of stuff. And if it had been 20 years earlier, or even 10 years earlier, I would have felt oftentimes that what I was doing was beneath me. I should be doing more, and I should be doing it in a more profound way. But you know what? When you get into watering the plants, it's just so perfect. When you get into feeding the animals every morning, whether you're tired or it's raining and you don't want to, you get and you feed them because every day they're going to be hungry and every day you're going to be with them. You just start to look at the world a little differently. And sometimes I envy farmers because they see all that every day. And when you're in this urban environment, you see graffiti and car crashes and and a lot of impatient people and you go, wow. So I started to change my mindset. And then we get into like right effort. And I'm thinking, well, what would right effort be in this lifestyle now? You know? And right effort means you continue your spiritual practice, whether you see the relevance or not, whether you understand it to be true or not, whether you lack confidence or have confidence, you still one step in front of the other. 
walking forward. Because once you get on the spiritual path, there's no way to get off. You're stuck. You know, and you're going to start relating to people in a much different way, and they're going to start telling you about something, and you're going to say, you don't care, but you still listen to them (laughs) because you're practicing (laughs) compassion. You know, you're going to do like a whole lot of stuff differently. And all the people that had been at little IBMC as residents had started to do stuff differently, and that's why I thought they were really odd, and I was becoming odd like them. (laughs) And not even realizing it. So right effort is just like this spiritual energy that needs to be roused and, 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 and enjoyed every day. That this is the first day you've ever lived. You're going to come up against people you've seen before and thought you understood, and they're going to be completely different because you're completely different. You're going to have to decide what's important to you now as compared or as opposed to what's important to everybody else, the general consensus of what's good and what's bad, what's important and not. So right effort. And then after arousing the effort, it, it doesn't go away. You know, that this energy is with you every morning, afternoon, and evening, and it just keeps pushing you forward, even if you want to get off the, the trail, get off the road. It just won't let you go. Right mindfulness, looking at the world in a different way, looking at a world in a way that has a bit more equanimity, a few less opinions. How do you look at the world and not have opinions? Because one of the joys of being human is we have thousands of opinions about everything. And we're happy to share them with anybody who's willing to listen. You know, and they with us. And so how do you look at something and not have an opinion? Can you see it? Can you see it if you don't have an opinion? Can you see it if you don't know what it is? It turns out you can't. You're blind. But what you can do is you can feel it. You can come to this sense of, of this, this place of intuition. And, and you experience things in a much different way. Not in a dualistic, intellectual way. But sort of a interconnected everything kind of way. And you start to see how this connects to that, even though they're not similar and have nothing in common, which sort of gives you a leg up when you're doing stuff, because other people are blind to that. They only see the object. You see how all the objects are connected. And you go, wow. But then with this mindfulness, you, you're at a place that sometimes you can be irritable. You cannot be happy. You, you've seen how crappy the world is. And it's everywhere you look. You know, you walk into a restaurant and the floor is dirty. The, the, the people who work there could care less. The food is cold. And most people are going, oh, what a great place to eat. And you're going, this is terrible. <laughs> but it's always been terrible. Now you're just seeing it for the first time. You know, and the lines, the lines. I find myself wanting to direct lines. They're standing in line with their cell phone. I'm saying, you you can move forward now. It's okay. (laughs) You know, it's just like, where did the efficiency go? You know, and in my neighborhood, at the Food for Less, nobody shops alone. You buy milk, you got three generations of family with you, you know. So the lines are really long, you know, and you go, wow. How do you deal with that? How do you come to a place of accepting how cruel and unfair the world is? You do it because of concentration, right concentration. Right concentration allows us to go into these altered states of consciousness and find bliss and harmony in every present moment we experience. It's really cool that you can just sort of bliss out and have a half smile and glazed eyes (laughs) and still get things done. And and people think you're high, but you're high in your spiritual path. That's all. You're you're using it to your advantage. Because you don't want to hate people. And you don't want to be super critical about people. So you just bliss out. And they're all part of you now. And you're part of them. And so the line moves exactly the way it's supposed to move 
and you're there with a half smile, you know, and it's okay. So this mindfulness and this concentration allows us clarity but compassion. And the clarity and compassion combined is what the Buddha figured out was most important. That if you have too much clarity, you'll never give a dollar away. If you have too much compassion, you'll give all your dollars away. There's a happy balance. And you can find it if you fine-tune your insight and your bliss. There we go. There it is. So I'm working on this, and I'm working on this, and I'm seeing the people who are weekend monks and nuns. I see them as leaving and becoming dissatisfied, and and they want to have a big following, and nobody cares what they say, and blah, 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 blah. But the whole idea is you're not supposed to really care if they think you're saying something profound. You're just supposed to share how you understand your path to be how you understand Buddhism to be to you and let everybody else see it their way so we can point them in the right direction for we don't want them to see what we see we want them to see what they see and so many times we just want to replicate our teachers and be just like them but it's really doing a disservice to us because we may have something more to give than they do, or we may have something else to give, or we may have the same thing to give, but in a different way, that'll be understood by different people and allow them to start seeing as well. So it's like waking up. How do you wake up? How do you wake people up? You can't wake people up. You wake yourself up and encourage them to start to see. But when they start to see, they get bummed out. And this is the point where our spiritual energy needs to be strong. We need to go through that part of the world sucks. You know, before we did it, the world was perfect and just so wonderful and I was so happy. And then we get into the world sucks and nothing is the way it's supposed to be. And how could people live like this? And once we come to the other side, the world is just the way it's supposed to be. And it's perfect and we're happy and they're happy. And and we don't have to say anything because we've gone through that middle place. In Zen, they say, when I first saw the mountain, it was a mountain As I started to practice, it became invisible. When I continued to practice, the mountain reappeared. So there's that place, the dark night of the soul, that we may get to in our practice. And we need to have the confidence, not the faith. I I let the Christians have the faith. The Buddhists have the confidence because we have proven this path to be true because we've tested it ourselves to see if it worked for us. And if it doesn't work for you, you shouldn't ever be a Buddhist. But if it does work for you, you shouldn't rely on faith. You should rely on the confidence that you have now because it's well-tested and proven to be true to you. Not to the teacher or all the followers, but to you. So I was in this place of two years of mild depression. Then I got into Buddhism, and Buddhism told me everything sucks. You know, and then I went through that, and then it really got sort of, wow, this is terrible. You know, and and then, and then, something happened. You know, and you're never going to know what it is or when it's going to happen. But then you sort of look around and you can still smile. And you go, yeah, this is just an amazing place to be. You know, of all the billions of solar systems out there, this is the only place you're going to find people like us, which may be a good or bad thing, depending on what part of the path you're on. And then you go, yeah, you know, humans are just amazing creatures. We can redirect the course of a river, and, 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 and we can show so much compassion to a lost dog or cat, and feed them and give them a home and fix them so they won't have any others. And we can do all of these things, and, and, and we're so complex, and sometimes so idealistic, and sometimes we know exactly how it's supposed to be, and I find as I get older, I know exactly how it's supposed to be. i got to be so careful, because I see that, like, I'm the only one that sees it that way. <laughs> And, and even if I have an opinion that might be regarded as, you know, valid, if, I only, if I'm the only one that sees it that way, it's going to just a big waste of breath on my part. 
So I have to let other people see it their way as well. And that's why I like Facebook. Because I can post something with a certain intention, hoping people see it in the way I do. And then all of a sudden, nobody sees it in the way I do. And, and, and then they start being super critical and wondering why I posted it and what does it mean. And I'm thinking, this is Facebook. When, this isn't a university class. We're not being graded. Nobody ever graduates from Facebook. They just abandon it. And, you know, just lighten up. And, and en- <laughs> enjoy the fact that I spent 10 minutes trying to assemble a picture and a saying to give meaning to something in somebody's life. You get there and you get old and you just sort of get dissatisfied because people sometimes are more clever or less clever or it's faster or slower and all these things. And I'm going, wow. And now, Facebook told me I had been on Facebook for seven years. I am going, no way. And I asked a friend, have I been on Facebook for seven years? And she looked at me and felt a little sad. (laughs) She said, yes, you have. (laughs) Don't you remember? And, And I didn't remember. It didn't seem like seven years. I don't know how long it's been. I can't tell anymore. I'm thinking, is this a natural product of aging, or have I finally got into the present moment? (laughs) Where all I have is now, and all the other stuff just seems so unimportant. Because that's what I'm doing now that counts. So maybe senility is similar to being enlightened or waking up or being in the present moment. Who knows? Who knows? But I've got to be really careful now because I don't know how long I've been doing stuff and how long I'll continue to do stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm just doing it today and hoping for the best. So this path, right view, right intention, right speech, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, this, this path allows us... To, let me see. Now, the... Let me, I, don't, I think I missed some of the path factors. Let me go again. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. See, it's still there. This path allows us to experience our life in a much different way. And as I look at Buddhism, I see that is really the ultimate and it allows us to experience our life in a way that lessens our suffering. And because of insight and compassion, we're able to give meaning to things that we couldn't before. We're able to see the priorities of life in a much different way. We're able to see that no matter how bad or negative you feel, kindness should be your motto in everything you think, say, and do, even when you say no, even when you disagree, do it in a kind way. And, and then I look back at my life, and I have been living at International Buddhist Meditation Center for like 23 years, in the same room, which is really full now. <laughs> you just accumulate stuff, and it's really full. And then you add a couple cats, and it's home. You know what I'm saying? So I look back at that and I say, was that a good choice on my part? How how much did I miss by living in that room? How much did I miss by being focused on a spiritual path? Would it have been better to have gotten married, have children, had a life similar to what most people aspire to? Would that be the way to go? And, And I have to say, after all these years and after all this meditation, I just got lucky. People might look at me and say, well, you don't have much money, you live in a room, you you feed cats every day, what kind of life is that? (laughs) You know? And it is a blessed life. It is a life that few people ever attain because they want more, not less. And in this season of giving and receiving, the only way you're going to have enough is to want less. And I have succeeded Though I have a couple things I'd still like to get, 
<laughs> but far fewer things than I normally would have wanted. And, and that's cool. I, I'm lucky, and I'm happy, and I'm really looking forward to sharing this with UCLA and the story of my life. And then, and then one morning, I woke up at 3 and said to myself, you know, I'm going to be having this legacy at UCLA. I wonder if there's a Buddhist museum that I could donate my robes to. And then when people walk into the museum, they could go, oh, those are Kusala's robes. Remember him from the library? Remember all the podcasts he made? And then I'm thinking, and I got all these wonderful certificates that are framed. Where am I going to put those? In the library next to my robes. And I'll just sort of build this thing. And then, then I watched a YouTube video of Burt Reynolds. <laughs> and it was his life. And he set up like a little museum for himself. He had all sorts of stuff in there that just identified it as him. This is who I am. I mean, wow. Maybe I don't need a museum. <laughs> maybe it's okay to give my robes to somebody else when I die, and they can use them. And maybe the certificates would be useful in a fire because they serve their purpose. But see, that's what happens when the ego starts taking credit for what you've done, even though the ego is one of was only one of the contributing factors to everything that ever happened in your life. And the 9,999 other factors that you had no control over allowed it to be this way. How can you not look at life as a miracle? You know, we all have our little goals and plans and we've mapped them out. We even have the Eightfold Path. But my gosh, if we relied on just that, we'd never go anyplace. So we rely on Sangha, the image of the Buddha, the, the stories we share with each other about life and, and success and failure, and all those things make the story of our life. And here we are. So it's with a certain amount of forced humility that I say I'm looking forward to speaking, but I know who's going to be talking, and that's the ego, because that's its job. So I'm going to have to be really careful what I say, how I say it. Now, they also say that we can block what you say. And, and if you say something unkind about somebody, we can just take it off until you die, and then we'll put it back. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, and so I'm thinking, okay, so I can, I can have that sort of censor until I'm gone, and then people really know how I feel. <laughs> but, but do we need to go there? Do we really need to speak poorly about anybody in speaking about the story of our life? Because everybody, I think, in our life did the best they could in relationship to us. The parents and relatives and, and friends, you know, they, they, they were rooting for us. They were hoping we would succeed at some level and da, da, da. So I don't think anybody did it consciously if they were mean or uncivil or hoped we'd fail. But I think it's just when you speak about your life, if you can, and you, and you look at it as being a good journey and a fulfilling journey, I think that might be good enough. With so many people who don't have that, who are living in Syria or Afghanistan and just, you know, just worried about survival, that's their focus in life, not what we're focusing on. And today, I got. A Facebook friend from Iraq wanted to join the, the Kusala Facebook. And I'm going, really? Iraq? You know? And then I looked at his Facebook postings. He's sort of like I am. So all these differences we see, we're forced to see, maybe they don't exist. Maybe the truth of the matter is we are all interconnected and interdependent. And our success is not predicated on what we do, it's what everybody else does.